NFL Podcast, Episode 9. What what a group this is. First of all, this is the first BC group, all BC group, because I've had a bunch of dicks on this thing from the East and the East Coast of the U.S., and all they want to talk about is the East and Eastern lacrosse and all that stuff. This These guys are true Western legends. And so I'm excited to have them on. Uh, first, you know, guys, I, I grew up with, with Dan Stroop, so I'll start with uh, Danny Stroop, Burnaby guy, uh, legend in the National Cross League. He's in the Hall of Fame, uh, started his career with the Baltimore Thunder. Many people don't know that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then on through coaching and, and, uh, and a lot of the cool things he does, uh, in women's lacrosse today. And then Chris Gill, who's the current uh, head coach of the Vancouver um, Ravens, Vancouver <laughs> Stealth. <laughs> Sorry, Vancouver Warriors. Sorry, my there bad. There you go. Um, yeah, so Chris Gill, current head coach of the Vancouver Warriors. Um, and then Russ Hurd, who uh, we all played with growing up, uh, played against growing up, um, is is much, much older than, than the other three guys on the call. Uh, but Russ Hurd was a legend with the Toronto Rock as a player and coached with the Mammoth when they won in 2006. And and we'll have some fun talking to you guys today. Fellas, welcome to the TFL Podcast, Episode 9. Thank you. Thanks for having us Thanks on. Having on. Well, now that we've started that off really well, thank you is the best answer. Um, uh, guys, I know that all three of you have gone into and have been inducted into the Canadian Lacrosse Hall of Fame. Um, and Gilly, you didn't you went in the year after these other two guys, correct? Uh, no. no. Or you go in the year before. Yeah. Anyway, these two guys, Herbie and Dan Stroop, go in, and and Russ Hurd's nickname is Herbie, and Stroop is Stroopy, and Gilly is Gilly. I mean, it's really not that hard to figure out. But so Herbie and Stroopy go into the Hall of Fame, and it was comedy night at the Hall of Fame induction ceremony with these two jackasses doing their show, and uh, and and. I watch. I wasn't able to go and regret that, but but it was uh, streamed online, and it and it's still, I think, available for those of you that haven't seen the Thursday night comedy act down in the, at 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 Chuckles in New West. Um, but anyway, I think talk about going in the Hall of Fame, and then what what you guys decided was going to be comedy. Well, I'll, I'll talk first uh, just because uh, the first thing Gilly said to me after Stroop and I did our speeches was those were the second and third funniest speeches he'd heard. So, <laughs> <laughs> But Stroopy, like, I know you referenced your wife a lot in, in your speech that she let you play. And so that's been kind of a theme throughout your career. And Gilly... Just quickly, as as Stroopy gathers his thoughts, because I know it's going to take a while to get him started, but talk about being his roommate and who packs his bag. Yeah, well, it's like Rita's actually on the road with us because he'll be like, what did Rita pack today? What do, I wonder what kind of suit I'm wearing. Do I have matching socks? Rita would have taken care of me. I know she did. So yeah, Rita, Rita's everything. If, if, I'd be afraid to see what Stroopy would wear if Rita didn't pack his clothes every day. Rita Stroop is a saint, and uh, she's Rita Stroop is a saint. She's the one that packs uh, all of Stroopy's clothes. I, he opens his suitcase and does not know what he's about to wear that night. Right? Never Stroopy, does. Never does. You don't Never know has. what you're gonna wear so, when you go on the road. It's, it's, his favorite line, it's, here's, his, here's his favorite line. He would say he'd, he'd finally get it gathered up. He'd ask me to iron it because he doesn't know how to iron, and then he'd go. Oh, oh my wow. God! I think we're in trouble at home. We're in trouble. I go, why? He goes, Rita's put me on the market. Look what I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> every day, every line, every it's game, it's ridiculous. I'm on the market, really. I'm on the market. <laughs> All right, Stroopy, you warmed up now. I, I just well, going back to that the Hall of Fame there and the, having to follow Russ Heard his speech. Yeah. 
That was the most terrifying thing. He was hilarious. Yours, <laughs> yours was pretty darn good yourselves, Trivi. Oh, man. I didn't know what I was saying after you. I was still laughing at yours. That was, uh, that was a good night. <laughs> For those of you, night. we really should try and find the streaming um, uh, tape of this because it's unbelievable. Um, the, the two of you went off, and, and I, I laughed so hard for basically uh, – I think you guys went on for about three or four hours. But uh, <laughs> anyway, they told you – they gave you five minutes, and the two of you went on for at least an hour. Um, sure. Fellas, talk to me about – Herbie, talk to me. Who put the lacrosse stick in your hand for the first time? Well, as you alluded to earlier, I think I'm the oldest uh, guy here. So that's a long time ago to remember. But I'm going to guess, I think I was probably four or five. It had to be my dad, I would say. I, I grew up a block away from Queens Park, so it was kind of law that you played lacrosse. Yeah. Of course. Well, for all of my listeners, you know, keep the cards and letters coming. Thank you so much for all, all of the messages. I appreciate it. But Queens Park Arena is in New Westminster, British Columbia, and is kind of the, for lack of, it's it's like the Taj Mahal of box lacrosse in Canada. Really, I mean, uh, the Peterborough Mem- Memorial Center is probably one, but but you know, the Queens Park Arena, iconic building in Canadian lacrosse. The fact that Justin Morneau did so well in baseball was and was from New West was shocking because we didn't know anyone was allowed to play baseball in New West. Everyone played. <laughs> Stroopy, how about you? Who put the stick in your hand for the first time? I guess uh, mom and dad, they uh, they had my older brother, Dean, signed up, and um, they just said, well, you're playing too. So I uh, I was four. I think he was six. And they said, yeah, you're, he's going to practice, so you're going to go. So I think I started with him first year. But, uh, I, and back to, back to thanks for all the messages and notes that you get. I don't think all of them are good, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you haven't watched my cooking show. You gotta watch my cooking. I show. did. I saw your cooking show. It's pretty good. Gilly, how about you? Who put it in your hands for the first time? I mean, look, I know, I know your dad, and just just out of respect here, um, Dan Stroop's father, Ron Stroop, um, unbelievable human, amazing dad, uh, passed away not too long ago. I want to show respect to him. Same with with your dad, Chris, who. Uh, legend in British Columbia lacrosse and was a massive builder and, and, and tremendous giver to the game. Uh, and, and that should be noted. Um, and I'm sure it is. He's a, he's a hall of fame member. So you got a father, son team, hall of fame member members, um, so on Gill and recognizing him. And I, I'm pretty, pretty sure I know how the stick got into your hand. And obviously I know your mom's family was big in the game as well, but just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, well, I grew up uh, right across the street from a lacrosse box, Smith Box, legendary box in Coquitlam. Um, but yeah, my mom's, my mom, so my grandpa, my mom's dad and her grandpa, they're both in the Hall of Fame. My mom's grandpa is a charter member, so in the Canadian Lacrosse Hall of Fame. So everyone would say it was my dad who put the stick in my hand, but my grandpa put the stick in my dad's hand. So uh, it's from my mom's side, but uh, yeah, my dad made, bought the house across the street from the lacrosse box. So. Between the two of them, it was a team effort. So, yeah, I think I woke up every day, went to the box, came home, nine o'clock. You think you would be better go, if, if you have... spent that much time in a lacrosse box? You think you'd be a better player? So don't uh, nobody tell you how to pass. <laughs> oh man, I'm still open, bud. <laughs> you still open. Look across <laughs> the crease, you, you'll see me. You only, only played at one end of the box, the offensive end. <laughs> oh, it was yeah, slanted. Just, the box had a floor that went like this. He was 30 there years no mirrors in your guys' room. houses? There's no mirrors in your houses, eh? You guys watch the video? I think you're in the same end as me. Herbie, sometimes you went back a few times, but uh, yeah, Stroopy, me and you were beside each other the whole time, bud. <laughs> I, I do want to acknowledge that I did not know. I, I think I knew that your mom's family was, was in lacrosse, but like that's a lot of Hall of Famers out of one family, Gilly. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, it's uh, – it's pretty awesome to, to have everyone talks about my dad, but my mom, her, her side of the family is uh, the true lacrosse. If it wasn't for my mom's side, my dad wouldn't have lacrosse stick in his hand. So yeah, it's pretty awesome. Pretty cool. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, you know, and, and, and not to be serious for a moment, but uh, uh, 
with all the diversity issues that go on in lacrosse, understanding that, you know, your background, um, you know, you were growing up in an era in lacrosse where, you know, it wasn't a very diverse sport in, in British Columbia in the lower mainland. Just tell me a little bit about how that made you feel. Um, well, <laughs> I, I guess I kind of thought I was white. <laughs> <laughs> I play, play, play with all my buddies and I didn't know any different. You know, I just, a, a young dumb lacrosse player kind of thing. And, um, not until you, you, you get a little bit older, you realize that, Hey, there's nobody else like me in the dressing room. So, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it wasn't a big, a big deal for me. And, and, you know, the, the area of tri cities we lived in, it wasn't too big of a deal. Um, you know, as it is across the world or, or, uh, maybe in the East coast, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, it didn't really, I didn't factor baby it wasn't a big factor in my life um my my dad on the other hand it was different he he was the first one in burnaby um his family was the first family in burnaby so for him it was different but for me Coquitlam, it was okay well good kind of well, felt like Strippy didn't like to pass the ball to me though i don't know if that was a factor but hey it, well i don't know that that was a racial issue <laughs> oh yes, 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 yes i had the shot i had the shot <laughs> when didn't you <laughs> yeah yeah that's what i'm saying there was a great story i remember a great story well it, it wasn't great for me but toronto rock beats the washington power in a playoff game sometime around 99 2000 2001 Probably and a number of years, yeah. number of years <laughs> that, yeah and i walked up to stroopy after the game and i was so pissed off he ended up having like five goals and beat us almost single-handedly and and I, I always thought of the Stroop family as hardworking, lunch bucket type of, of players, right? They, they showed up to work and they just did their jobs. And they were, they were those types. That was – I knew Dean, his older brother. Uh, I know him very well. We grew up the same age, played a lot together. Uh, and, and Dan was a year younger. We played in junior. We, you know, we played together in Burnaby. And ultimately – I went up to him after a long history and I said, how does a plumber like you score five goals and beat my team again? And it was supposed to be a compliment. And was a, I think that was there one was of tone. The, there was tone. What's that? It was <laughs> yeah, tone. tone. It was tone. Okay. So I just want to point out that that was, that was one of the gaps in our relationship at that point that we didn't probably talk for another two or three years. And then there's another gap and we'll talk about that later on because it affected both, you know, Stroopy and Gilly on where they went after they played for the Colorado Mammoth and won a championship. And and then he, you know, Danny and Rita didn't talk to me for another two or three years after that until I hired you guys as coaches. <laughs> I remember that. Neither of you two hold grudges. Neither of you two hold grudges, right? You guys neither hold grudges. So <laughs> easy going. Cali BBQ is proud to be an official sponsor of your San Diego Seals. Buy our slow smoked barbecue at any Seals home game or online anytime at www.calibbq.media. Talk about going into a, an MILL locker room for the first time because I know, you know, Gilly and Stroopy, you kind of went in first before Herbie. Um, I was in Philly and you guys ended up playing in Baltimore and, and, Dan Stroop and I had long conversations about him joining me in college because I really wanted another Canadian to come down and play. And because of Rita, he didn't get to go anywhere in his life and do anything <laughs> interesting. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't think so. I think I was I was uh, working again in the fire department back then. But uh, That's true. And yeah. now you're a fire chief and you're a big wig, and I was kidding about going anywhere in life. But uh, <laughs> the point of the matter is, you didn't come down, but you did. I did talk you into coming down and playing for Baltimore. So tell me about that experience for the first time. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, and it, it's in the Halloween costume box, is uh, the uniform with the spandex shorts. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we got rid of those because that was – playing in front of 18,000 people with spandex on wasn't my thing. <laughs> I can understand that with a package the size of yours, why that would be a problem for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is a this is a late this is a late night one, eh? But yeah, going into the first dressing room was uh, well. I was I was with uh, Baltimore. They had legends on that team. They had 
Mark Millen, Martino, Canabine, they had a bunch of guys on that team that uh, were, were legends or are legends. And uh, for me, a kid from BC that nobody knew, and I had a terrible year. So it was my first year was nothing to really remember except people I met. But uh, as for my playing in that, it, it was brutal. But um, yeah, I met a lot of good people. Played in front of a lot of crowds, and I thought my career was over after that. So you didn't win the Rookie of the Year? Nope. No. Nope. Didn't win. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> but, Gilly, you go to Baltimore the same time or after? And you guys did. I think it was, what, you guys, was the year after. Kinda... Or two, one year after, Sripi? I was 95. <laughs> what year were you? 95. Yeah. Yeah. So mine, for me. Don't, like, catch on in the league. Like, it, it – no. I don't know if it was it wasn't a great experience for you, but it, like you both moved down there for the season, right? Yeah, Thank mine you. was. Uh, hey, just to add on to Sroopy's, um comment about spandex, why he didn't like him, he was like one of the only guys ever in box across to wear hip pads. So I think people saw those on his thighs and his hips <laughs> there because it was pretty embarrassing to see. So I think that's why you didn't like spandex, buddy. Those weren't hip pads. <laughs> oh, what were they? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, sad. back to – yeah. Hey, with, uh, with, with Baltimore in 96, it was funny because when I got there, they're like, okay, you're another Canadian. Okay, yeah, we had uh, Dan Stroop, and like Stroopy said, you know, didn't light it up. And, but they always talked about one other guy. They're like, so, you know Brian Nicola? And I'm like, yeah, I know. He's, oh, okay, so you're friends with him? Oh, so you can fight. So you're oh, – okay, good. You can be our fighter. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. They had to the wrong guy the wrong tree with you two. <laughs> Yeah. You don't want me fighting, but I guess Brian <laughs> tuned up a couple of players and uh, he, he became a legend. So all Canadians were tough. So, so Herbie, um, yeah, anyway, Herbie, they, they start their career in Baltimore, which wasn't an illustrious start. Um, but not soon after, right? Like maybe two, three, four years later, Johnny Meridian starts to put together the Ontario Raiders and you, you start, before that, though, you remember the uh, superstar team, uh, Charlotte Corpus? <laughs> oh, I forgot about them. <laughs> so I played. I forgot Charlotte. about that. So I, 96, I'm in Charlotte for that powerhouse uh, OM team. And we played in Philly. What was the record of that team again? Uh, I believe it was 0 and 10. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, uh, Charlotte Cobras, for those people out there that don't remember the national or the sorry, the major indoor lacrosse league, Charlotte Cobras, yeah. they were 0 and 10, but had some unbelievable guys on that roster. We had uh, was on that team. We had we had myself. I hurt my shoulder about a week beforehand, but that wouldn't have it wouldn't have mattered. I I told John Tavares one time. He asked me what happened in Charlotte. I said, unless I'm unless I'm Tavares or Gary Gate, you couldn't play on that team and have success. And no offense to the guys that were on the team, because we had a couple of good ones. We had Matt Ogilvy and Chris Bates. Uh, we had Katanchuk and Patrick Todd Creed. Katanchuk was there, yeah. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> white and goal. But our guys were all fuel lacrosse guys from Virginia and places like that. They had no idea how to play box lacrosse. And you couldn't get past your own guys to get to that, let alone the other team. So <laughs> very, very trying year. But uh, we had a lot of fun, though. Gilly came down, uh, Baltimore was playing in Charlotte, and as Gilly was prone to do back then, he missed his flight uh, back to Baltimore. <laughs> we, both, we both had a bye week, uh, and uh, so we decided to go to the bar. It was Katanchuk, me and Gilly, and all of a sudden at two, 2 in the morning, we decided to wake up Pat McCready and say, you're driving Katanchuk's car down to uh, Miami. So uh, <laughs> yeah. McCready didn't know how to drive a standard, so Katanchuk was in the passenger seat doing the stick for him and telling him what to do with the pedals all the way down to uh, Miami uh, Beach. And we were, I think we were, there, we were there for about four days, Gilly. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, it was quite a trip. And I remember yeah. it was the blizzard of 96. It was a big blizzard, and Rob yeah. Williams was, uh, was stuck in Baltimore. We had no phone. We had no TV or nothing. He had no car. Bobby Watson drove home with the car because we had a bye week, and he was stuck in a blizzard by himself with no food or nothing. <laughs> And he yeah. was afraid. We weren't living in a great neighborhood, so he was afraid to leave the place. And Rob Williams, for those people, right? That Rob Williams is a current assistant coach with the Calgary Roughnecks. You talk about the the um, 
connections that all these guys have like we've all known these guys for a really long time and so you know 96 you talk about 96 we were playing together long before that and playing against each other for even longer before that but um yeah rob williams who played with you in baltimore right gilly was on that team and and missed out on that trip because of the snowstorm yeah it was crazy so tell me talk about going to ontario because at this point in time you know, three guys that ultimately end up as Hall of Famers in Canada and pretty good ball players, you know, amazingly become like free agents somehow and and all end up on this team in Ontario that, you know, missed the playoffs by one game uh, in in their first year. But ultimately, as you and we'll talk, I want to talk about Maple Leaf Gardens and what that that franchise meant to the league and still means to the league today. Um, and and what that transition to Maple Leaf Gardens meant. But tell me about going there for the first time in that Ontario Raiders team. Well, Stroopy, we were on Team Canada, and Johnny Meridian was the manager of the team, right? And he was the one who was setting up the team. He's like, hey, do you guys want to come out to Ontario and play for the Rock or for the Raiders? We're like, yeah, okay, how's that going to work? We're in the fire department. And he says, yeah, we'll fly in every weekend, and, you know, we're going to build a team. So for me, I was like, okay, no brainer. If if you if I get drafted there, let's do it. So I guess it was Rochester. Did every did every team get a a pick, or was it just a couple teams got picks that year? I don't remember. Because Belowski ended up going to Rochester, and we got drafted to go to uh, the Rock, Ontario. Yeah, right. All, right. No, all, all I know is you went in like the first round. I went in like the tenth round or something. It was. You should have played better in Baltimore. Yeah, if you're a Raider, I didn't play any better either. So <laughs> if you look better in spandex, you would have got picked sooner. What's that? If you got if you look better in spandex, you would have got picked sooner. <laughs> I think that might have been it. My legs were too skinny. I don't know. Yeah, no question. But Herbie, you go you go to play for the Ontario Raiders. It was a much better experience. Same colors in the jerseys, by the way, but yeah. much better experience in Ontario than it was in Charlotte. Well, for me, it was a little different uh, going to Ontario because uh, I wasn't on the team initially. Stroopy called me up and told me about the team. So he says, yeah, call Meridian up. So I, I called Johnny Meridian up, and he, he looked at my stats because I had similar stats to Gillian Stroops in Baltimore in uh, Charlotte. He says, yeah, he says I, think, I think we're good. We'll call you if we need you. Well, that, that man pissed off. You're done. We don't need you. You're plugged. You're done. And so that's what I figured. So I wasn't doing any training, nothing. I was just playing hockey. All of a sudden, they get three games into the season, and uh, and Stroopy, Stroopy's phoning me up saying they want you to come play. I said, Stroopy, I haven't been doing any training and stuff. I've been playing hockey. He goes, just talk to him. I said, no way. I'm not talking to him. He goes, talk to him. Talk to him. So I talked to him, and Johnny Rainer says, well, we might need to bring you this week, but uh, we're not sure on injuries. And he says, do you think you can play? I said, well, as long as you know, I'll, I'll work real hard to get in shape, but I'm not in shape yet. He says, okay, sure. So – Long story short, too late for that. They called me the next day and say, you need to come out tomorrow. And, uh, and I was sucking wind for the first three games, but it was a lot of fun getting there. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll there we that. go, yeah. That's, that's kind of what happened. But uh, <laughs> he says, uh, I, I remember it as, uh, get, you got any goal scorers out there? And I played Russ all the time. I said, yeah, Russ heard. And uh, he goes, oh, we need him out this week. And, and uh, so I go back to Russ. I said, Russ, are you going to come out? And uh, he goes, yeah, give me, give me three weeks. I'll get in shape and I can come out. No, no, no. They want you this weekend. <laughs> so he comes out. He comes out. And we, we never practiced, but there was like a meeting the night before or we made it after practice. And uh, we were walking in and uh, you hear all the snickers, all the, the rest of the players kind of giggling. They thought that they hired another coach. <laughs> 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 and then he goes, and we go out. And I think he got four and three that night. We won. Yeah. So that was it. He got a, he got to lock it in for the next few years. He was awesome. <laughs> did they pay you in steak? Uh, at first, they did. <laughs> we had to push the extra premium. So, little known story, uh, you know, about Russ Hurd and his dietary restrictions or lack thereof. <laughs> um, I played with I I I played with Russ Hurd in Burnaby Senior Lacrosse. And we used to have post-game parties, and you'd go to a house party after a game. Somebody would have a house party, and all the guys would roll up with a cooler full of beer. And, you know, and, and we'd, 
proceed to spend most of the night hanging out, talking lacrosse and, you know, this and that. Herbie would pull up with his cooler of beer and he had a second cooler with a brontosaurus steak that was about that big. And he would find whatever grill that he could at the house that we were at and he'd cook his steak up. And, and we were all sitting there marveling. It's like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night post game. And he brought his own steak to every post game party at every house we ever, you know, ever had a drink at. And we would be there till three or four. He would eat for the first 45 minutes. And then he would, you know, he'd proceed to drink all night as well. But um, I, I mean, Gilly, Gilly, Stroopy, back me up on this because spending time with Herbie anywhere near food is an experience. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I remember the uh, I remember the subways. He liked to take subways with him wherever he went, not just one, two. And I'd be like, "What do you got on there, Herbie?" I got some uh, meat and some bread. No butter. <laughs> Anything else, bud? No. Oh no. Well, like, no butter. No to get cheese. It down. Nothing. Right, it was and he would <laughs> he would take the bites. It would be so dry, and you would like you were like a steak, going, just choking it back. It was unbelievable. We would sit in the airport and watch you. No was, butter. Here, no here. cheese. Remember our, our pre games at the Spaghetti Factory in Toronto? Oh. For, for some reason, we ended up doing this. I don't know. I guess we won a few games. So he said, We, we got to go game. to the Spaghetti Factory. Yeah. So every day, we, our pre game, we go to Spaghetti Factory at lunch, and he would order two factory sized spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> and the poor waitress, every time, oh, those are really big. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't and he didn't maybe and, done before us <laughs> yeah and he didn't like the the soup or the salad and then she said well you get us you get two soups or two salads with that and he's like oh no i won't be able to finish that that's no 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 and she's like oh, you're getting two factories it's little tiny little soup bowls and he's like no 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 and it's not like it's not like he took his time either he inhaled it oh it's ridiculous herbie what rebuttal the- uh i guilty as charged i don't eat like that anymore but i used to uh i will get i'm sure we'll talk about it later you remember the, the dinner in buffalo the chop house so i got there yeah but just going, I do back remember to, that. going back to the difference between uh charlotte and 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 uh, ontario and hamilton just to give you an idea i remember coming up after our first game and coming to the hotel and uh all the guys from charlotte they've got their suits on and they're they're asking us they're in our room saying do you mind if i have a soda They've got like I think uh, a musical on TV, and then fast forward to my first game with uh, Hamilton, the Ontario Raiders. I come upstairs to our room. They got porn on the TV, and everyone's got the beers going. I said, "Yeah, we're we're back in Canada." <laughs> like, just a slight difference. Tay, talk about walking into the Maple Leaf Gardens for the first time, and then the first championship. Obviously, that's a it's an unbelievable story, and I know. Uh, there's, there's actually uh, an article on Inside Lacrosse this month talking about Caleb Toth and that whole experience. But uh, people should go uh, go read Inside Lacrosse um, and read that article. But you guys were there firsthand. Talk about walking into Maple Leaf Gardens is a cathedral. Um, we talked a little bit about Queens Park, but like Maple Leaf Gardens is the cathedral in Canada for hockey, and you guys were front and center uh, playing lacrosse on that big stage. It was. I, it was remember cool. walking, I remember walking in there, and the, the, the fans were on top of you. It was. It wasn't the you know kind of waved out or right on top of you. Um, you're on the bench, and they're the fans are walking through the bench with their hot dogs and their fries, and and it's, they're right beside you. And they're it, it, the atmosphere was loud. They. Um, I remember looking at that <clears throat> where um, the owner Ballard used to sit for the Maple Leaf games. They had that little square in the in the corner. And I was like, okay, there's that square. Okay, I, I know where we are. Look at all the banners. Look at the names up there. It was pretty friggin' awesome, man. Like, it was so cool. It, it, now that the new arenas are like big, huge warehouses, that, that place had atmosphere. It was so cool. I was in awe the whole time. Strippy, yeah, how about you? Walking down the tunnel, they had old pictures and obviously Stanley Cups and championships. And uh, it, was, it was amazing. Like Gilly said, they had the – They'd wait for a break in the game, and then they'd walk behind you, and uh, it was it was hot and steamy and sweaty. It was it was pretty cool. It was, uh, and I, I do remember like the first game we had, maybe six, seven thousand, and ten thousand, and before you knew it, it was sold out every night. So that that helped too. It was uh, 
It was pretty Strooby, cool. This, Strooby, this is why I love Herbie you because feel a hot dog too from a from a uh, fan when they're walking by between a TV timeout. Herbie just grabbed the guy's hot dog and ate it. Yeah. This is why I love you, Stroopy, because you said it was pretty cool because it was hot and steamy and sweaty. <laughs> I guess. I guess. Yeah. Maybe those weren't their best words, but yeah, it was. It was like a bar. It was like a. It was like a barn in uh, in BC here, right? You're playing summer ball, and it. Uh, but with 15, 16,000 people. It was pretty cool. It, it was I, it was a pretty okay. unbelievable place. But yeah, yeah. Herbie, what was your impression? You played there for the first time. I, I remember just when we pulled in that night, when we got there into Toronto, and we stayed at that nice place, the Best Western Primrose on the corner, where they never knew our names. And uh, <laughs> just wanting to get down the street to see Maple Leaf Gardens was pretty cool. But uh, uh, like those guys said, it's, what a unique experience when you're playing a game and people – on stops the player coming behind the bench behind you. It's crazy that they played NHL games there and did the same thing, but it was pretty cool to play there and so, playing there. What's that? Uh, during that time, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs are not performing, right? They're not the best team in the national hockey league and haven't won since 1967 and Stanley cup and all on come the Toronto rock in their first year, uh, and, and, and obviously, Ontario Raiders played at Cops Coliseum in Ham Hamilton and missed the playoffs by one game. But that was a good team that figured it out about halfway through the year and could have been, in 1998, done a lot of damage. I will say that the Philadelphia Wings won in 1998, and I retired, and you guys, I passed the torch to you guys because I couldn't win anymore. But Do you remember who you guys played in the last regular season that year in Philadelphia? I do. And it sold I out absolutely range? remember. Remember what the score was? No, because I you forget the you forget the team that doesn't make That's the playoffs. Right, Ontario won fifteen six against Philadelphia. Steve Dubbs, Philadelphia Wings. The fans were throwing batteries into our bench. They were hitting us in the head, and then you guys went on to win. I, yeah, would, I would only tough. say you never remember the team that doesn't make the playoffs, and we were focused ahead on winning a championship. And you guys, I think, I think we lost the, out of the goals, the goals for and against. It wasn't uh, not against us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about that first championship win in in Toronto and in the Maple Leaf Gardens against Rochester. And John Grant hates this story, um, and. But, but that was super special. Like, that was transformational for box lacrosse in Canada, right? It was transformational for the National Lacrosse League in, in Canada. Um, I don't know what Herbie's doing either, Gilly. What is he doing? My, uh, I have no idea. My, uh, my phone is getting low, low. I had to plug it in. Okay. Um, <laughs> technology. Anyway, I transformational. It was a it – was a, it was a, iconic moment and Caleb Toth obviously scored the big goal but tell me about that game and what that game meant to you guys and and how that felt but Herbie talk about that game that wasn't uh 99 he scored that goal that was in 2000 99 was against Rochester we won by three I think oh my bad no worries yeah you're right that's that's how it went yeah anything special happened in that game Stroopy which one the first one well and you get like Go seventy-three goals that game. Oh, I don't know. The uh, I think I think Colin Doyle was uh, and Bobby Watson were uh, on fire that game for us. Yeah, I think Doyle had a big that game. Yeah, yeah, Colin Doyle. Uh, he he seemed to show up and have big games. Well, I'm glad it was such an iconic moment. You guys can really go on and on about it. <laughs> Thank you so much well, for did, joining did you, the show. Did you see? Did you see the interview that? Um, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Dietrich. Uh, was he the goal? Uh, yeah, he was the goalie, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you see his interview recently where he said uh, they were talking about, you know, how would they, how would they were going to defend that last play of the game with uh, Caleb Toth, that, the Caleb Toth goal? And they said their huddle on the bench was, Stroop's on fire. Let's just make sure we don't let, let Stroopy have a shot. So they were all focused on Stroopy. And if you actually watch the play in slow-mo, we did a little a cut and Stroopy kind of faded off a bit. And we passed it from right or from that side. It was supposed to go over the Doyle and into Stroop, but they all took Stroopy and just hovered and left left Caleb wide open. Um, actually, hearing the opposing teammates talk about what they talked about in their huddle was pretty awesome. So Stroopy, you were uh, you were a big reason why we got that goal because they put four guys on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. 
Yeah. Is that, there. There has that adopted time. your coaching <laughs> philosophy against the San Diego Seals? You just try to kick the shit out of Austin Stotts? <laughs> oh, sorry. Never mind. You must have watched that game. <laughs> oh, man. A quick break. This episode is sponsored by Manscaped.com. Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and hygiene. If you've been listening to our channel for a while, you know that we are big fans of Manscaped and their Perfect Package Essentials Kit, which is the world's finest all-in-one manscaping kit that makes manscaping safe and easy. And just when you think they've got it all figured out, they take it to the next level. I'm excited to be one of the first to confirm that after 18-plus months of research and development, the new Lawnmower 3.0 Waterproof Body Trimmer has just been released and comes with a ton of new upgrades. Get 20% off plus free shipping from your Perfect Package 3.0 purchase when you use promo code SEALS20 at manscaped.com. That's code SEALS20 for 20% off at manscaped.com. Now, back to the pod. Who would you guys put in the early MILL or NLL Hall of Fame that's not there? That's a long time ago. It's hard to remember who's not there that should be there. Well, who would you put there? I see a couple guys. A couple guys here. I see two or three guys here. Well, I'm assuming I'm part of the three and not the two, but whatever, <laughs> Stroopy. <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you for adding me later. That that was really cool of you. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, somebody said Kevin Finneran, which is is definitely an interesting discussion. I know Kevin ended up going up to play for the Toronto Rock at some point, but I don't think he was there when you guys were there. No, not for me. I was gone then. Were you there, Stripey? Yeah, I think we played one year in 03 together, yeah. Yeah. Thinner, yeah. He's he was good for a long time. <laughs> yeah, he was really good. Yeah. yeah, there was a couple of players in Baltimore over there, Stripey, that, uh, you know, you, you've said some of their names that, <clears throat> that really, you know, they – the team – it was a weird team in, in Baltimore because we played a lot of field lacrosse plays. You know, a one-three-one and a stack and play off the stack and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, what? Are you doing a stack? But there's some good players there that, that probably could be in or should be in. Well, they're all Team USA. They're all uh, amazing players. Yeah. Yeah. Were, yeah. Certainly really a guy like yeah. Mark Millen who ended up – Mark Millen who played kind of a long time in the league and ultimately didn't win until he uh, – the stellar GM in Philadelphia ended up getting him to the wings and, and they ended up winning. Oh, Frenchy? French? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just warm it up. It's almost over. <laughs> uh, no, 2001 when Mark Millen ended up in, in Philadelphia and playing with, with that group. Yeah. He, he had five. He, he was a pretty, I mean, unbelievable player, obviously, an outdoor and a USA standout, you know, UMass um, uh, college player, and then ultimately played for a number of teams in the in the uh, indoor league, but played also played for the Baltimore Thunder in, in the uh, MIL, or sorry, the MLL. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, yeah, a guy that, that probably deserves accolades in, in the early stages of the hall of fame for uh, indoor he, he certainly adapted pretty well he was so good he, he had such a good shot he uh, uh he was one of the guys that that you know he was such a good player in field across that i think all in his if i'm not mistaken he's from long island and a bunch of the guys in baltimore had this rift with long island players so they're there he wasn't well liked at the time and i'm like what he's the best player in our team we got we really should like this guy. You should like, like him. We, yeah, we, uh, you know, Baltimore people don't like Long Island people. What? What's going on here? So, um, yeah, he, he was so good. He, he was slick. He was smooth. Even in that, I remember in the World Championships for field there that year, Stevie, um, he was impossible for our D guys to, to cover. He, him and, yeah, he, he was, he's such a good player. He was. That- well, 2000, 2001 NLL, the championship games, I think we were – Probably the only time we were the favorites to win uh, yeah. Toronto, and uh, you guys beat us, Steve. And, and he had five that night. He was he was on fire. He was, you remember what the game plan for that was? Big that, was that was cover Bergie, cover Marichuk. They were so good in that side there, and all of a sudden Finneran and Millen just had the ball all night and just shot the lights out. There. Well, was, Jake uh, Bergie obviously comes way. to mind as a as an NLL Hall of Famer that probably should be in there. And and you talk about loads to cover, 
you know, he, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't an easy man to cover. Um, and people might know, um, Jake Berge, his dad was a, a football player for the Philadelphia Eagles and Bill Berge and huge, huge wing supporter, um, and, and an amazing man. But, uh, yeah, I would put Jake Berge on that. I just want to ask a question. Um, we've talked a little bit about, and I know you guys have all coached in the National Lacrosse League and the head coach's award for, for excellence in coaching uh, in our league is the Les Bartley Award, and you guys all played for Les Bartley. And he certainly had some quirks, but uh, uh, you guys all enjoyed a level of success under Les Bartley's coaching tutelage. And, and I, you know, has it influenced you guys as coaches and, and – you know, his philosophy and, and all of, all of he, what he brought to the table. I think uh, Les was uh, extremely good at being a motivator. He was not an X's and O's guy. He put the right coaches in the right places as far as like his offensive and defensive coaches, but he wasn't a strategist on his own. He was just very good at uh, organizing and being the rah-rah guy and getting the most out of guys that way. It was, it was a little different at first, but once you got used to it, uh, you know, you really liked the way he got guys going before a game. And they, they were – he was very, very organized. He always had – the coaches had – we had, had video if we needed it. We went over stuff, and everyone knew what they were doing. Everyone had a – had a – had a – so I, I, I liked it. I like Les. I remember – it's true we talked about it all the time. Um, you could shoot on your own net, score top corner, and he would tell – he would tell you how great your um, – your shot was great goal, great shot. Whatever you did, he was pumping you up every time. Um, you, it's it's hard to uh, to be a player and have someone doing that all the time. But so that's why Stroopy's never seen a up. shot he doesn't like. Yeah. What's, what's that? I said that's why Stroopy's never seen a shot he didn't like. You had Bartley pumping his tires all the time. <laughs> I, I went I went one one for twenty one shots one night and. Uh, I thought, oh, I'm probably never getting flown back out here again. That was terrible, right? And uh, he just comes behind you on the bench. He rubbed your shoulder. He goes, next game, right? Don't worry about it. <laughs> He's just always pumping your tires, always keeping you up. And, uh, you know, so he didn't once, call in you. A while, once in a while he'd come down the bench and say, we need one. We need one, right? And just you'd do anything for him. You just wanted to do well for him because he, he treated everybody so good. He was just, a, like Herbie said and, and Chris, a motivator and a – he instilled confidence in you, so it was, he was awesome. So he would call you a plumber at that point? <laughs> no, we talked all the time. We were <laughs> – <laughs> we never fought. <laughs> Herbie, so you retire after playing a number of years in Toronto and, and didn't go on to play for the Vancouver Ravens like these two guys did, but what, what was – you could have played at home. What was the motivating factor there other than age and, you know, too many stakes weighing you down? Uh, age, uh, you know, you get the, you get to the end, and and in my case, you know, the back, the shoulder, and the knee wasn't so strong. And you want you want to play, and you want to be a part of championships, but you want to contribute to those, and you don't want to hang on. So it was time to retire from both leagues. <laughs> but then he decided to play sixteen more years of lacrosse after. Yes, for he, well, he plays well, summer lacrosse, which is harder on your body playing on well, concrete. <laughs> Well, it's amazing how much when you you're not going all the time, you're not playing in two leagues. Uh, when you take a break, how much your body recovers? You know, obviously, I'm not comparing myself in any way to Gronk, but uh, you look at Gronk, and all of a sudden he's back playing football, and his body's recovered. You know, your your body needs a chance to recover, and you don't get that when you're playing all the time. He played. Russ played last year in a WLA game when he was 60. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago, uh, he texts so, he, he text me. I don't know why, we, and uh, he says, uh, yeah, "I'm playing tonight." I said, "Yeah, right." Sure enough, he was Eddie. I think he met him if he scored. Like Gordy Howe, he gonna, Pats. Gordy Howe, he played in five decades. Never, wow. never, never agreed to anything with Steve Goodwin over drinks in the bar the night before when your team is shorthanded <laughs> about playing the next day. <laughs> hey. Uh, so moving on, and, and I don't talk a whole lot about the Vancouver Ravens, but ultimately you guys end up together again uh, in Colorado. And, and I'd like to think I had something to do with that. And 
Um, certainly when Gary Gate was thinking about an offensive coach, he, he had a list of guys from Victoria that he wanted to to bring in, and, and we just couldn't make that happen. And, and I recommended Russ Hurd, who was uh, kind of a early stages of a coaching career in, in British Columbia lacrosse. And uh, he joined us, and then you guys were there in, in 05, I think, and um, a couple of years in that process. And then 06, um, we kind of caught lightning in a bottle in Colorado with the Mammoth. And um, it was a pretty special team, and having uh, having a group of guys that, that I look fondly back on. Uh, but why don't you guys just talk a little bit about the Colorado Mammoth? Yeah, for me, um, you know, <clears throat> when we were – okay, let me go back a little bit. We were in Toronto. We knew we were going to win every game. It didn't matter what the score was. We just had that confidence in, on the bench. And with the Mammoth and that run there, we were we were good, but we weren't great. We weren't a great team that ever that we were favored every game. I think that group came together because we were so tight in that dressing room. We were a good, it was a good character dressing room with everybody having different roles, playing those roles, unbelievable. Um, you know, Jell Bear and, and Hamford and Sims on the faceoff team getting everything. Gene Ash lighting it up. Um, you know, our offense was Gavin Prout leading everything. We we had big boy on you know Coyle and Ethington, those kind of guys on defense. It was such a a, a group of guys that came together at the right time. And like you say, we got on that, on that, on that run there and we were never, I don't think we were a favorite on any of our playoff games in that, uh, in that series there in that run. And, and we had some tight ones, but man, that was so, it was different than the, the championships that we won in Toronto. That's for sure. Um, I will say uh, one of my, that, favorite, that room was awesome. I, yeah. This is an aside from, from this and it's just, I'll just inject this story, but one of my favorite relationships on that team was Gilly, the relationship you had with Rich Catton and the fact that Richie Catton, who's a sheriff and you were a firefighter and the, 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 the conversation that would go back and forth between you guys about who was, who did less at work was to me, one of the funnest things I, there was, there was a lot of that going on in that group. There was a lot of American Canadian, you know, uh, uh, you know, East Coast, West Coast. There was a lot of guys coming together to play on that team that 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 maybe hadn't played with each other. There was a lot of backgrounds that were different, and you guys came together in a way that was pretty special. But that relationship between you and Richie Catton to me was was one of the highlights. Yeah, Richie, uh, he was a he was a bit of a a bit of a, a guy who you like to get under his skin and, and rattle a bit and. I think actually, I think I got, I started getting Langtree to get under his skin a bit too. So it really just threw you off because you don't yeah, want Langtree going out there. I, I can't imagine, Tree being so reserved, I can't imagine. <laughs> he would do that. Tree, Tree used to call him Bull Shannon from Yeah, That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, absolutely did. I just remember Richie Catton would have his headphones in and he'd be listening to Pour Some Sugar on Me by Def Leppard. And you could hear it even through his headphones. You'd hear it through the whole thing and he'd just be sitting there banging his head, getting ready to play. Yeah. He's doing the one handed drummer. One -handed drummer. <laughs> yeah. That was good. Uh, Herbie, you coached that team and it was a bunch of characters, but talk about what, you know, you and Gary and, and, and how that interaction came about to, to get these guys to do what you wanted them to do. Well, obviously, you know, with Gary there, you know, being such an amazing offensive guy, it, it was pretty easy for him to, you know, anything that Gary Gate tells any offensive guy they're going to listen to. But uh, like Billy says, uh, with, with that group there, um, really, we, we, we weren't the best team all the time, but guys coming together. I think uh, if you look at our, our team offensively, you know, we had – not a lot of depth, but I think the big thing with that team, our strong transition with, uh, um, was Jalbert, Sims, uh, Nick Carlson, and Cubby winning all the face downs, and Gene Ash playing great in goal. And then, like, like, uh, Billy mentioned some of the guys with the defense, Tommy Ethington, you know, uh, uh, Richie, um, Cat, Coyle, Gallant, a bunch of guys, all great character guys, they all came together. It was just a fun year, like, just the way everyone came together to, you know, and the best thing to me was when we were in Buffalo. I don't know if you remember, but there wasn't a lot of respect coming out of the Buffalo on 
on them playing us. They thought they just had to play their game and they're going to kick our ass. And we were so prepared for what they were going to do. The game plan went so perfectly. Everything that Gary put in play went exactly as we wanted to. And uh, just to beat them as bad as we did in Buffalo, I mean, obviously, you know, great satisfaction for you, great satisfaction for all. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I do remember, yeah. I do remember the pregame meal, and, and you brought it up earlier. We went to the Buffalo Chop House as the staff and the coaches, and Ward Sanderson was a member of that staff. And for those of you that remember Ward Sanderson, sausage fingers, he, he you know, he, it was very hard. Somebody said him trying to send a text message was, was a, a, somebody trying to type with soup cans. Um, and, it, you know, it was pretty funny, but – but I do remember going to the Buffalo Chop House and, and you getting a steak that literally, I, I swear to God, they were going to give you a T-shirt after you <laughs> ate the steak. And, and well, this, the Buffalo Chop House is a, is a very nice, very, really expensive restaurant. And you ordered a steak that was, I could not believe the size of the steak. It was literally from, you know, out the, the great outdoors movie where, you had Wrong to eat candy. the gristle, you had to eat the whole thing. You ate it all, and then you started scraping the marrow out of the bone. Before eating bone marrow was cool. Like, now you go to a restaurant and they make it for you, eat the bone marrow. You're carving the fucking bone marrow out of the steak and, it, and because you didn't get enough. Well, if you remember correctly, uh, uh, it was a 48-ounce, and uh, – <laughs> Ward, Ward's a bit of a lightweight. He only ordered a 32-ounce porterhouse. He couldn't finish it, so I had to finish his porterhouse for him, too. <laughs> but, but if you back up a little further, you, I don't know if you remember that day, but uh, we're, we're going to the chop house, and then Gator says before uh, after practice over, he goes, yeah, you want to go to the food fair instead? I said, I said Gator, there's no way. You, you can't dangle the chop house in front of my face and then try to tell me they're going to go to the food fair. He He goes, hurry, hurry, settle down. Okay, we'll go to the chop house. <laughs> And then, go to the food fair first, and then we'll go to the chop house. <laughs> but you remember, we were trying to decide because we had our mammoth track suits on and stuff like that. Should we go straight there or should we stop? We didn't realize how high end it was. And uh, we went back and changed, and thank goodness we did because uh, I think we had to, they had to give us ties too to sit in there. I, but, it, they did have to give us ties. That was quite yeah. funny. I do, there's so many stories that revolve around restaurants in Buffalo. There was a story, yeah. Billy, you yeah. remember this. We went to – what was the name of that place? This, the, some steakhouse. Some place. Yeah. This one. This – we all get okay. subs. It's myself, Pat Royal, Chris I Gale, had a so We had a all get subs. They're so good. These things are so good. I should make these on the TFL kitchen. But uh, <laughs> Stroopy yeah. has a bit of an acid reflux issue. And he goes it was outside. a medical – Problem. It's like minus 27 degrees in Buffalo. We all eat these things as fast as we can. And Stroopy's out there puking on the curb and going like, we asked him a question. We thought he was choking. He was ready to die. Oh, 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 and he's puking in the freaking street. I'm just sitting back here being quiet. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> so good. That didn't, that didn't happen. <laughs> oh that didn't happen yes yes it did there's a lot of food stories sorry herbie you weren't there for that one but it was pretty funny. i was going down for the count and all three of you guys are laughing at me <laughs> we're laughing at him and he's choking but he's also giving me don't talk to me while i'm doing this don't talk to me i'm choking <laughs> i gave you the international sign nobody did anything Nobody yeah. well, we, luckily, we had a firefighter there to help us. Yeah, I don't want you to help me. Yeah, he was lucky. Uh, hey, buddy, I helped you on one flight. <laughs> Another quick break. Coronado Brewing Company is proud to be the official craft beer partner of the Seals. Enjoy fan favorite Orange Avenue Wit and their new Salty Crew Blonde Ale all season long and visit coronadobrewing.com to find their award winning beers near you. Stay coastal. Cheers. So if you guys could pick a most underrated player that you ever played with or coached in the National Lacrosse League, Gilly, who would it be? Uh, I Back uh, in the early uh, early times for me playing, it would be Rod Squire from Toronto Rock. And obviously Russ Hurd, he, uh, he deserves way more credit than he, than he got because he was one of, the, one of the best to play that I don't think many people knew about or 
or thought he would be as good as he was because he was like 94 when he came in the league. So uh, those two for me would be would be big ones. Rod <laughs> Squire is an interesting one because because Kimbo Squire does get some level of credit, right? He was a um, I mean he was an unbelievable offensive player, but but Rod Squire, not a lot of people will bring his name up. He got so many loose balls. If there was a scrum in the corner, he would come up with it every time. He was solid on defense, around the floor well, smart decision making. He was he was really good. Rod Squire had a center of gravity that was so low, he just grabbed every loose ball, like Gilly said. And he was so underrated because Kim Squire told me recently that his brother, I think he was first or second in his last year junior in scoring. And I didn't even know he was an offensive guy. He, he just – he didn't say anything. He just played defense. He got every loose ball and just did his job and never complained, never tried to play offense at all. Yeah. Who would the who would the guy recently be, Gilly? I, you said somebody recently. I, I, I'd i go with two guys I, that, you know, we were with in Colorado. For me, it's uh, J.J. Bear and Greg Downing. Wow. Two guys that are – two guys that I think are just so good that don't – don't get enough credit or didn't get enough credit. Joe Bear was a stud. He was a freak. And he got better as, as he, you know, started playing more. But I think concussions kind of got in the way for him, right? Jay Joe Bear, who was on episode two of the TFL well, yeah, podcast. You, so you may want to go back and listen to episode two uh, because I think both you guys were talked about in that, uh, that episode pretty significantly. So I think, I think uh, I agree. Jay Joe Bear might, I think he got a lot of credit in field across, but in box across, he might be the best player I've ever seen him play overall. You know, there's a reason why we called him the weapon. The guy was incredible. I've never seen a guy, you know, go right, left, pick up his speed, turn on a dime, shoot right-handed, left-handed the way he did, and play both ends of the floor. For an American lacrosse player playing box across at that time, he was unbelievable. <laughs> he could have been. I'm like, dude, go talk to Gator. I don't I got nothing to do with that. Should have put him on the right crease. Stroopy, how about you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stroopy, Gilly huh? wants your position now, you, you know, because you were the Ready? probably Surpri one of the greatest creasemen of all time to play our game. I'm surprised um, he knew there was a – he knows there's a right crease. He never passed there. <laughs> <but. boy. laughs> Ah, uh, nice headphones. So, how about you? <laughs> I don't know. I, I love those picks. Those are great picks. Uh, oh, Roddy, great. Was, that, Roddy was ditto. Good. That's that's great radio, buddy. Ditto. Roddy was. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, you Thanks get, for can't joining ask the show. Questions and keep talking. I know it's your show, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Roddy, Roddy was the. Do uh, you guys remember when Roddy would? He didn't like to fly. Yeah, even though he was a, he was an iron worker, we had a back to back against <laughs> you guys one night in um, in Toronto. So we played in Toronto Friday. We had to be in Philly Saturday, so we all flew down. Roddy didn't like to fly, so he got in the car, and drove down to Philly that night, so he didn't have to fly. He was uh, he was a bit of a character too. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna change gears real quick, and I want you to do this fast. Just the first thing that comes to your mind um, when I say these names: Tom Marichek. reverse backhand. <laughs> Magician with a stick. Very talented, yeah. Dallas Elliott. Stud. Elite, awesome. Quick, fast. Track the ball. Bat Batman. Batman. Yeah. He was, yeah. <laughs> incredible, incredible reflexes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> John Grant Jr. Goat. Goat, goat, goat. What'd you say, Stroopy? <laughs> Unbelievable. He's amazing with the stick. He's awesome. He was, I think, uh, as awesome as he was, he got a lot better in the second half of his career when he realized that passing the ball with three guys on him was a better idea. And uh, he liked, I think, early in the career, I don't mean this in a bad way, but early in the career, he liked the highlight balls with three guys hanging out in the bounce shot reverse back end. And as he got a little older and smarter, he realized that, uh, you know, he could really make guys around him better by moving the ball and scoring. All right. Well, so much for quick reactions. Tom, uh, Tim Sudan. Tough he, he was, a, he was a, Tough. A, an American who ran the ball hard and ran through you, and he had a hard shot. I just yeah. remember him running the ball hard and shooting hard. Really strong athlete, good at both ends. Mm. John Tavares. 
Who? <laughs> 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 Never heard of him. Oh, uh, amazing Coast guy! Amazing, great player. He was a great mix of uh, skill, athleticism, and, and smarts. Uh, very intelligent player. So, going opposite to very smart player, Jamie Hanford. <laughs> Cubby Bear. Funny, funny. Uh, yeah, best dressing room character I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. One thing I loved about Jamie Hanford is it didn't matter who walked in that locker room. Yeah. He gave you a hug and he welcomed you. Didn't matter who you were or where you okay. came from. If he didn't know you, he would he would open his arms and you'd be part of our family. First in the shower, last out of the shower too. Let's not get into that. Um, it's a family show. Bob Watson. Wherever was Watson. a dude. Another another guy with great reflexes, uh in close, uh, very very smart goalie. I didn't. Did I just say smart goalie? I've never said that before. Um, but a great, great guy, great team guy, <laughs> and uh, uh, just like the way he played. He was. He was a big game, big game player. We'd have zero championships if he wasn't in goal in Toronto. Yeah, Stroopy. Normal. He was. Uh, you know, just. <laughs> he was. You don't say that like like Russ said about goalies too often. I mean, there's a lot of great goalies, but. Uh, he was just a, a great person, a good goalie. Like if he one didn't go in or one went in that he should have should have had, he would say, "Yeah, sorry, boys, I should have had that." He wouldn't pin it on anybody else. He was just a great, great person, and uh, is a great person and uh, a great goalie. Yeah, amazing. So, I I try and end this process because I I I think the stories of the National Lacrosse League and lacrosse itself. Um, we don't we don't talk about it. We don't tell those stories enough. Um, I would love to see those stories memorialized, uh, like you see thirty for thirties, uh, because you guys are Canadian brethren, and we have to do conversion rates. What what would you guys recommend for a twenty four for twenty four um, for uh, thirty for thirty show in our lacrosse world? What what show? Any any story you could tell. What would that story be, Herbie? Uh, Stroop and Gilly and not passing each other in the trees. But no, those, those, <laughs> those, two would be good, those two would be a good story playing together for a lot of those. Wow. Hey, hey guys. Thanks, was, Herbie. Yeah, that's nice. I was going to go. Uh, I don't think it would it. last that long. It wouldn't be an hour show. Like, we could literally get maybe 20 minutes of material out of that. <laughs> we made up a play called Something Something. That no yeah. other creasemen have ever come up with, right, Strippy? That's right. Something, something. Well, where you look each other off? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would, I would give him a nice pass, and then something would happen, and then he would shoot and score. <laughs> <laughs> something, something. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we. Well, I was, I was roommates with Russ for years, but uh, or for a few years, and then like Gilly for like thirteen or fourteen years. So I think we could get more than twenty minutes out of it, but uh, <laughs> Russ. Russ, I think Russ would be a great story, but it, he's played for 50 years, so it'd have to be 60 for 60 or something like that, a little longer. <laughs> <but that. laughs> I do think, I, I mean, knowing you guys as long as I've known all of you guys, I do, the roommate story between, you know, the, the bromance that exists between Dan Stroop and Chris Gill has been ongoing for many, many years. And, and the fact that the, some of the quirky stuff that you guys do together, um, and, and keeping in mind that no one wants to room with Pat Coyle, <laughs> right? No one in the history of the game wants to room with Pat Coyle. But That's you two guys, like... He makes it easy, though. He doesn't want a roommate, so it's okay. No, he doesn't. And, he, and so then, no matter what happens, the team has to buy him his own room. I think he does it on purpose. That was the upside for Stroopy when I retired. When I retired, uh, Stroopy got the room with the – or was that upside for Gilly? Gilly had to have his room with Coyle, and he'd got come over to our room back – this was before cell phone. He'd come over to our room and use our phone, and Stroopy and I are like, what's going on? Uh, Pat won't let me use the phone before noon. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a room bully. He was a room bully. Still is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and, and, and only because he, all he wanted to watch was the Smurfs. Or yeah. SpongeBob SquarePants. Cartoons. Yeah. Cartoons. 
Anyway, that little known fact about Pat Coyle, head coach of the Colorado Mammoth, his favorite pastime is watching cartoons. He's going to get so mad. He's going to get so mad. So mad. (laughs) So mad. He he doesn't watch this anyway, and he'll never come on the show because he's not a TFL. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I digress. Hey, look, fellas, um, it's uh, for for me to have you guys do something with me as as part of this is, you know, we are we have intertwined our lives for a number of years together, and uh, I think the world of all you guys. I love you guys, and and certainly um, great respect for your lacrosse careers. Uh, amazing respect for the family men men that you are. Uh, and and the families that you guys are raising and and what you do for for young lacrosse players and youth lacrosse players and and growing the game uh, I can't say enough about it uh, I admire you guys you're certainly my heroes um, and and you mean a lot to me and I just want to say thank you for joining the show it's been a, a, a true pleasure thanks a lot thanks for having me on I'm having us on Steve this is a great uh, it's a great podcast you got set up here so uh, yeah, let's get back to playing some lacrosse soon, too. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Wouldn't Thanks, Steve. Nice? Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, fellas. Thanks for joining Thanks, me. Uh, come back to the TFL Podcast, Episode 10 next, and uh, uh, look forward to keeping it rolling. Look forward to having you guys on, maybe with another guest that maybe, you know, steals the remote and won't let you change the channel. <laughs>